folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are still in Matthew chapter 24. We're looking at, we've gotten past the um, uh, earthquakes in various places and the pestilences and the kingdom against kingdom and all of those things. We've gotten to the point where Jesus refers to that as the tribulation of those days, I think he meant days. I think he meant days. And then we get to, um, we were looking at the, the stars falling from heaven and so on. And I think that that is directly connected. If I haven't made that point, or if I did make that point, I'm going to reiterate that point, connect it to Second Thessalonians 2. But let's look at Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And then the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And th those reference scriptures all over the place in the Bible. Then shall appear the sign Notice that he said the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. A couple of things here that I'm just now noticing. I've noticed them before, but it just it just brought it back to my mind. Is that after the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That's Revelation six, shaken like a, of a of a rushing mighty wind. The stars falling like figs off of a fig tree, and so on. After that happens, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. You know, everybody has their sign. When I take my pen and I write on the back of my paycheck that I get, I put my sign, my signature on the back of it, and that's my sign. Um, other people made their mark somehow. That was their sign, that it was their hand that autographed that, that approved that, that, you know, signed that contract or, or whatever. Devils have signs. That's, look up the word sigil, S-I-G-I-L. They are weird, weird looking. Um, Led Zeppelin. The Led Zeppelin album, where each of the four band members used their magic sigil on the album itself, it denoted that they recognized that they, each one of them, had their own spirit, their own devil, empowering them to play the way they did, to sing the songs that they did. And of course, many of them paid, paid for selling their soul to the devil, paid for that power with their life. Look up the 27 Club. You'll see it, okay? But those devils, even devils, have their own sign. They have sigils. Now, what is the sign of the Son of Man? We're going to look at that here in a minute. But take Matthew 24, 29 through 31, and this is the after the tribulation of those days, sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall, heaven, uh, shall fall, and uh, so on. I believe that that directly connects to 2 Thessalonians 2. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. 
gathering together unto him. He says back here in Matthew 24, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. So our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken because the powers of heaven shall be shaken in Matthew 24 or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. And so we have the falling here, we have the gathering together of the elect, but the gathering together of the elect does not, it clearly does not take place until after the falling away takes place. And the falling away, I believe, is also seen here in Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 6 and other places in the Bible that we, in the past, have all looked at with these angels being kissed, uh, kicked out of heaven, one third of the angelic realm tossed out of heaven, they will fall to the earth, whether in the form of UFOs or falling stars or falling angels or however they look, everybody's gonna, gonna go, oh, hmm. stuff's falling everywhere. I think everybody will notice it on that day. Now, there's three things that he mentioned here as part of the, the, the gathering together of the saints, which I believe is the rapture or the translation of the saints. And yes, I do believe it comes immediately after the tribulation of those days. Again, I don't believe that that's seven years tribulation. I don't even believe it's three and a half years tribulation. I know that puts me out there in some weird place, but I'm trying to follow the scripture as best as I can. And the first thing that we're going to look at today is the sign of the Son of Man. What is the sign of the Son of Man in His coming? What is the one thing that He absolutely said for sure was going to take place as the sign that, number one, it was really Him? Because we have to watch out for a false Jesus. We have to look out for a false, false Christ the Antichrist, because we know by way of uh, uh, the witch at Endor bringing up a, a spirit called Samuel, wasn't Samuel. It was a familiar spirit that transformed his image to the image of Samuel. So here we're going to have, in the last days, a Antichrist who's going to transform himself into the image of everybody's view of the Messiah. And they're all going to say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, it's Jesus Christ. It's not going to be Jesus Christ. The signs, his sign is missing. How he got here is missing. His sign is missing. What is his sign? Matthew 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark 13, verse 26, 
And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Same thing Matthew said, only they, you know, changed power and glory. Uh, Mark 14, 62, and Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So that, to me, is the sign. That's what I'm looking for. That's what Jesus said to watch for, and that's exactly what I'm watching for. I'm watching for Jesus to come in the clouds. And I believe he's going to. Luke 21. See, we're not done. We got lots of wonderful things to study when it comes to these clouds and the symbolism of the clouds. What do they, what do they mean? Why is he coming in the clouds? Luke 21, 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear. This is sort of Luke's version of Jesus' sermon where he, where he talks about his second coming. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. There it is. And then, after that, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I love that verse. When you see these things begin to come to pass, when you start seeing the things that he told us to watch for, not what you saw on the internet. I got to throw that in there again. Not the stuff that people said is going to happen on the internet. When you begin to see the things mentioned in the scripture coming to pass, then lift up your heads for your, which way? Up. Look that way. Lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I love that. What it, what is what is the redemption that he's referring to? Uh Romans 8. I I love Romans 8. How does how does Romans 8 start? Romans 8 starts it packs a punch when it starts. Romans 8 starts right out and says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you know what the you know what the Spirit is, don't you? The words that I speak unto you, Jesus said, they are spirit, and they are life. So those who are walking after the Bible, noticing the Bible, watching the Bible, looking at what the Bible says, those who are doing that, there's no condemnation um, to them who are in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ Jesus to me is like being in the ark. When you're, if you're Noah and his family and the ark is, has been lifted up, you know you've made it. And though the ark rolled and go with the waves and everything else, at least you know you're not on the outside, nor are you going to fall out of the outside or outside the ark, nor is the ark going to tip over and kill you all, Not, nothing like that's going to happen. You're safe forevermore. Amen? So Romans 8 verse 22 tells us about that redemption. 
For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body you know what a coupon is don't you or as my wife says coupon a coupon is a little piece of paper says you get 30 cents off this 40 cents off that half half price this buy one get one free whatever and you're going to redeem the coupon means you trade the coupon in, the grocer, the store accepts the coupon, the restaurant accepts the coupon, and in exchange for that, you get a benefit from it, from redeeming that coupon. And in this case, we take this old body, hand it over to the dirt, and say, dirt, go to work on it. Turn it into corruption. We don't care anymore. We don't care what it looks like. We're not going to dig it up. Don't want to see it no more. Leave it in the ground. Let it rot. In fact, I, I, we spend a lot of money in this country uh, embalming bodies, putting them in airtight caskets, putting them, sealing them up in airtight and watertight vaults so that their dead body is preserved for the longest time. And who cares? What does it matter? Doesn't matter anything. It's going to be ashes and dust and corruption. And we get to redeem this body. This is the day of our adoption when we truly become not, not just the sons of God in name, but the sons of God in identity. It is that day we are truly born again into everlasting life. No more pain, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more, no more nothing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until, here it is, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. And all of this going back to Luke chapter 21, your redemption draweth nigh. So Romans 8 was telling us um, that there's a day coming when it's going to be the redemption of our body. Ephesians 1 says that God has given us a, a token of his promise, a, an earnest, like paying earnest money on a car that you're going to buy. The salesman says, boy, we got people buying these cars all the time. People, I've had 20 people look at this same car today, may not be here the rest of the day. And you say, well, here, here's $500. Don't sell that car out on me. So they take your $500. They've got your, in, your earnest money. That means you're going to go to the bank or do whatever it takes, and then you're going to come back 
and you're going to claim then the car that they promised you you could have that they were holding your $500 for. And if you never showed up again, they got your 500 bucks. So if you really want the car, you go back, you get the 500 bucks and say, now I want the car. Or you could put the $500 on, on the payment of the car or whatever. But the $500 is what we call earnest money. It means hold on to this until I return putting things in layaway or whatever. We put a little money down on it and say to the, say to the company, the retail store, hold on to this product under my name until I come and I pay it all off. And then once I've paid it all off, it belongs to me. And what God has done is that he has given us, not money, something better, the earnest of his spirit this word of god here this fantastic bible where we find these amazing things in here and every time we do and the we get the doodads going up and down our back and we start crying a little bit and we get a little happy in the Lord and we bend down and kiss our Bibles or whatever it is that you do when you read something out of this book and God shows you something brand new. That is the earnest of the Spirit. That is God's Spirit inside of you telling you, yes, you're still going to heaven. I've not left you. I have not forsaken you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Somebody say amen. Mm -mm -mm. which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. He sealed, he's, it's like he put you in a Tupperware dish or a Ziploc bag and went sealed you in there, mashed all the air out, preserved you, and he's not going to open the bag until he's ready to come. When he opens that bag and pulls you out, pulls out a brand new body. Not the old body, but a brand new one. That's the redemption that Jesus said, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. When? When you see him coming in the clouds. Acts chapter one, verse nine. And it, I mean, here we have an easy lesson that our Lord Jesus taught us. Actually, the two angels taught us this. Jesus was given last instructions in Acts chapter one. And he said, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. How did he go up? In a cloud. How is he coming back down? In a cloud. The same Jesus that they saw go up is coming in a cloud. And when he comes in that cloud, we will know him because that's where we're going to be caught up to meet him once he appears in the air. I would even ask you this, and, and what do we have to do on the day that Jesus appears in the cloud? 
Nothing. He's going to catch us up. He's going to bring us up. We're going to fly up there to him by the power of Jesus Christ. It's not like we have to have a jumping contest to see who can reach him. Nothing like that at all. In fact, what are the dead people who get to go first? What do they have to do? Same thing Lazarus did. He just woke up and he was alive. And they unwrapped him and he was just as fine as he was before he went into that tomb. Mm, 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 mm. So you understand now, this is the sign. There's a couple other things that he gives us we're not going to be able to get into today. But we're going we're gonna to cross-reference them. We're going we're gonna to run by them here in a little bit. One of them is the sound of the trumpet. Another one of them is the shouting. And we'll look at those a little bit later on. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, For this we say unto you, By the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, and, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, number one, where is Jesus? He's in the air, in the clouds. Where is all of the dead who have died in Christ? And I believe that goes all the way back. Here, let's do this. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's see here. Passed it up. Hebrews, James. There we go. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And this is the Faith Hall of Fame. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. Um, through faith, also Sarah. Um, by faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. You have all these, by faith, Moses. You have all these people who lived not by works. That's a lie. It's a lie for people to tell you that they, they were saved in a different dispensation with works with a works gospel. It's a lie. They were saved by grace through faith. And Hebrews 11 is telling you that. That it was done by faith. So we have all these people. And then all the other ones that they that they couldn't mention here. What, what, what about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets and all of these others? And then, because they get to go first, because they're dead in Christ, David and Moses and Samson, and because they died in Christ at their time, when they, when Jesus appears in the air, in the clouds, the trumpet sounds, there's a great shout, they arise first. And then after they've arisen, we arise. Notice Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore seeing we are also, are compassed about with so great a cloud, 
of witnesses. Who's the cloud of witnesses? Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel, all of those Old Testament saints that died in faith they're the cloud that Jesus is going to be in. The great cloud of witnesses. And then we're going to join them. And we're going to make an even greater cloud of witnesses to testify of Jesus Christ. And I think, the wor I think the whole world is going to see that. So he says, back in 1 Thessalonians 4, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And again, I I'm not going to argue the rapture. I'm I've got several invitations to speak this year, and it'll probably be in some churches that would disagree with me on this. I assure all of those churches and all those good men, all those godly people, I would never go over to, to their church and, and, and start some kind of fight by saying, well, I believe it's going to be this way and I don't know what's wrong with you people. I, I would never do that in a million years. So I, I may be I, I just may be the guy that God lets be wrong so that others can prove their through faith and through scriptures what they believe. Because I'm challenging you with the scriptures to prove what you believe. That's what I'm doing. And if that's how God wants to use me, that's... That's fine. That's, that's up to God. I'll let him do that. As long as I get to go to heaven, you know. Revelation chapter 1, last book of the Bible, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye is going to see him. Can you imagine the look on your neighbor's face all that mocking they did of you and all that laughter that they had on your expense and all the ways they tried to find fault in you so that they wouldn't feel guilty about their own sins and how they're going to see Jesus up in the up in the clouds and the very next person they see next to Jesus is you, their neighbor whom they know. You don't think that's going to get them in the crawl? I think it is. And I think God will, I think God will do that just to show them, hey, should have listened to my people. They gave you a chance. They offered you eternal life. They invited you to church. You just laughed and refused to come and didn't come. Now, that's the doctrine of it. And we have then several pictures of that doctrine. I like the picture part. I like the doctrine. 
But I like the picture parts too. Exodus 16. Notice I have the number 66 up here. What is Exodus 16? Well, we have 50 chapters, the book of Genesis, 16 more, 16 more chapters added to 50 makes 66. So we're in the 66th chapter of the Bible and what happens in that chapter. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, what did they see? The glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. We just got done reading the 66th book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? 66th chapter of the Bible says the same thing. The glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And what is this, what is this uh, chapter about? It's about God giving them the bread of life. For he says in verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and in it, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. You count those words? The ones I have underlined? It's exactly 66 words. And the manna that God sent, the bread from heaven that God sent to us, give us this day our daily bread. It's a picture of the word of God. So here we are in the 66th chapter of the Bible. God says 66 words telling them what this Poor frost looking thing is on the ground every morning, how to deal with it, what to do with it, how it's going to feed them and sustain them all their journey throughout the wilderness. And all they did in that whole time in the wilderness is despise that bread. It's all they did. What a shame. What a shame. But the neat thing about this chapter is the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. See, he had to. Because if the Lord appears and he's not in a cloud and he's glorified, well, he just kills everybody on the earth with his glory with his glory. That's what he does. He's not trying to kill everybody here. He's covered himself with a cloud so that the cloud shades mankind from his glory. Exodus 19, we go forward a, a few chapters. We have another story. This is where the Israelites are going to meet God for the first time at Mount Sinai. Take a look at what the language of the scripture says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord shall come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Now, 
he's given you a time prophecy here. Number one, he says, I'm going to come down in a thick cloud. That's how you'll know it's me. You see that cloud coming? You'll be, go, you'll be able to say, God's coming. God's coming. Look, there he is. There's that thick cloud, he said. And then he tells them, I'm going to do this on the third day. So today and tomorrow, wash your clothes, clean up real good, come not at your wives. I want you to sanctify yourself, purify yourself, make yourself ready for my coming. You know, I've been watching um, uh, some of these, uh, it's kind of funny because some of these courts are are um, transmitting their court sessions on YouTube. And some of these can be pretty funny, the way people act in court. When you go to court, there is what's called court decorum. You should at least try to dress up. Um, you can't go to court with a big cigarette hanging out of your mouth. You can't go to court with a big cup of coffee in your hand or a big gulp from 7-Up or whatever, 7-Eleven. You can't go eating a burrito in court. You can't use foul language in court and stuff like that. And it's funny because these judges, this, this one a black judge, and I just fell in love with her. And she, she kept repeating herself, you are in court today. Dress like you're going to court today. Appear as if you're going to court today. Comb your hair as if you're going to court today. Don't smoke because you can't smoke in a courtroom. Don't be up moving around through your house because you can't get up moving around in a courtroom. And I mean, she lays down all these rules. When, they, when they're doing these Zoom courts, she tells people, sit down, put your phone down on the table, fix it to where we can see you, turn your microphone on, comb your hair, dress as if you were in a courtroom, and act like you're in a courtroom. I like that. And God said, I'm giving you three days, clean up. You're fixing to meet God here. Clean up a little bit. And so, verse 10, The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. Third day is a time prophecy in the Bible. It basically means a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So if we were to go a thousand years from his first coming, the first day would be, take us from... 80, 1,000 roughly. The second day's diminished. Now we're entering into the third day. We don't know if it speaks of his birth. Probably not because of the time that's lapsed. So it's possible that it's going to refer then to his death. We don't know exactly what year that is. But I'd say we're pretty close. And Be ready against the third day. Since we know we're close, we at least ought to sanctify and be clean and be ready to meet the King of kings and Lord of lords and judge of all judges. Somebody say amen. So he says in verse 16, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud. And upon the mount the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. See that now? We have the clouds, we have the trumpet, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. 
mm, mm, mm. Uh, Moses brings them to meet God. Jesus is going to take us up to meet God, whom we have never seen before. Wouldn't you want to be in a different way if you were going to meet God himself? Wouldn't you want to be clean on that day? So we know he's going to do it on the third day. We know that there's going to be a trumpet sound. We know Jesus is going to appear in a thick cloud. We know those things are going to happen. So Hebrews 12 references that same story by saying it this way. For ye are not come into the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. In other words, when the Israel was brought to the nether part of the mountain, remember they weren't allowed to touch the mountain. They were afraid. Everything about that was fear in them. And they hear God's voice and they hear the sound of the trumpet and they see the cloud and the smoke and the burning and they're, and they're just going, Moses, you got to get us out of here. Get, get, get us away from here. Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. Moses, you go up, you hear from God, you hear his words, you come down, tell us his words, we'll do his words. Other than that, we can't, we can't handle that. That's going to kill us. So God says to the church, I'm going to make it easy for you. He says, um, so terrible, verse 21, so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. I love this. I love this. We're not come to Mount Sinai where we have to be afraid that even if we touch a rock on the boundary of Mount Sinai, we'll have, we would be thrust through. We would be killed where us hearing the voice of God puts so much terror in us that we, we're we afraid that we're going to die. That upon seeing the sight of the, the mountain on fire, scaring us to death, Paul says, we don't have to fear that. We're going to a different mountain. We're going to Mount Zion, which is in heavenly Jerusalem. We're going to have purified bodies. We're going to be clean from all unrighteousness. We're going to be washed from all of our sins on the day when Jesus appears in the clouds. He appeared in the clouds here and it liked to have scared them to death. They said, we can't, we don't want that anymore. We don't want to hear God's voice. Moses, from now on, you be the mediator. We can't, we can't hear that voice. We can't take that voice. 
I'm not, I'm not seeing, I'm not looking at God. I'm not. Scared them to death. But on the day when the trumpet sounds and the shout comes from heaven and from all over the world, the day that Jesus appears in the clouds, I don't believe we're going to have fear in our hearts. I think we're going to be shouting. I think we're going to be shedding tears of joy. I think we're going to be hugging one another as we go up with those new glorified bodies to be with Jesus. We, we will have finally made it on that day. And that day is the day that I am looking for. I hope you're looking for it too. Again, maybe I'm wrong about when it happens. That would be good if I am. It's not a contest with me. It's not, it's not a, a thing where I hope I'm right and you're wrong so that I can show everybody how right I was and how wrong you were. I couldn't care less. But I do believe if God, is, if God can save us, then God can preserve us all until the day that he appears in the clouds. We've got a lot more examples to show you. Oh, they're beautiful ones. And I hope this is a blessing to you. One of these days, we're going home to meet Jesus. And with all that, you can forget about Fauci, you can forget about Gates, you can forget about COVID, you can forget, forget about going to the hospital. You forget about all that stuff. Just, just forget about it. And set your eyes and your sight upon the one who's going to redeem you from all of this one of these days. Would you do that? Would you do that? God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Yet another feeding taking place in Kenya last week. And um, we're bound and determined to continue to do that ministry until the Lord comes or until the Lord says stop. I would hope that the day the Lord says stop, that it's because everybody in Turkana, Kenya, has food enough to go to bed with at night. I would hope that that's the case. Either way, I love you and I appreciate your love for us and your support for us, your prayers for us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.